This is Primitive Outfitting, and you are listening to The Gritty Bowman. Bam, chicken, wow, wow. <laughs> bow, bow. Nice. <laughs> and I'm not standing on my high horse saying, I shoot a self-bow, because there's no way in hell I'm shooting a self-bow. <laughs> when I say that, I mean that in a good Christian way. As far as Cecil goes with me, I mean, I could really give a sh- crap about that lion too much. And all I was looking at was the tip of Aaron's arrow. <laughs> and it was like this and this, and then it was kind of shaking, and then it went... Boom, solid like a rock, and I'm like, oh, oh, oh. It- <laughs> and he's like, I gotta know if you hit anything or not. You never really show excitement, because I don't. I just, I'm yeah. kind of always mellow. And this thing, you're ready to jerk a tear. I was running around like an idiot. <laughs> Woo! You know, if you ever talk to anybody from Africa, they're all about hunting lines because they eat people. Yeah. The compound, I have total confidence. With this thing, I'm like, hey, yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> but the way that America works, we're so soft, like, softer than baby. All of us, basically. The uh, the shooting errors, I'm going to call it Matrix Effect. I panicked. Look at her face. Must be, glo- might be flashing red strobe, dude. Isn't it crazy? That's the one thing I worry about. All right, folks. Welcome to the Gritty Bowman Podcast. Aaron Snyder and I are here in the uh, mountains of Colorado. We're coming at you from the wilderness. We are. <laughs> Official wilderness. Yeah. Yeah. It uh is about the only place we can get into without any major snow issues and uh catch fish. They weren't big fish. If you hear that in the background ground, that's a uh, storm rolling over us. It snowed earlier a little bit, it didn't stick or anything. More yeah. hail than anything. But uh yeah, this place is pretty cool and it kinda gives us a a chance to um do some dry runs through gear, test out some stuff. The norm, the yeah. norm for spring. Yeah, you're watching your. But for those of you listening, <laughs> Brian's watching Caitlin, his daughter, climb this uh, fairly substantial hill. I wouldn't <laughs> want to climb it right now on the other side here. She's she's trucking. She about, she about got there. She's almost to the top. But uh, but yeah, we had a lot of uh, listeners uh, email in, message in with questions. We're going to cover some of those, mostly about campsites, what we do when we get. Uh, you know, get in, get set up, where we camp, why, things like that. I mean, one of the the big questions that um that I got was the system when we uh when we set up uh when we set up camp, what what happens like for a buddy team and um you can tell when you've went with a guy that's actually camped before cuz generally don't have to tell him. Um like last year when Brian and I went, we never really camped before. He was doing the stuff that I wasn't doing, but the the general idea is when you find a camp spot um you know, depending upon if you have a floor or floorless shelter, I'll set up, let's say, the uh, the shelter if we're using a stove. Brian will go grab firewood. Um, when he gets back from firewood, about the time, that's the time I got the stove set up or the shelter set up. And then Brian will start rolling out the bedrolls. I'll put the stove together. Somewhere in the means of that, somebody's going to lose it, rock, paper, scissors, and have to go get water if that's a, a ways down, depending. Same thing with a floored shelter. Um you know, one guy's setting up the shelter. The other guy's probably going to go get water for camp water uh, for the night or for the next couple of days, whatever the case may be. And then, uh, you know, somebody may be rolling out the bedrolls while the other guy's cooking dinner, boil, boiling water. Um, you know, it's it's really just, uh, you know, dependent upon if you're buddy teaming it or not. Uh, for one, you know, as far as two guys sleeping in one shelter or if uh, you're both sleeping in solo shelters. But you always want to be proactive the other thing you want to think about that i i you know i've I've got my my girlfriend amy with here with me and she she asked a lot of questions on the camping stuff if the shell if tomorrow let's say it's snowing horribly what we'll do is pack up everything totally inside the shelter right like everything will be packed completely we'll bounce out of the shelter we'll run and get under a tree get all our stuff tucked in or, or put a rain cover over our packs, whatever the case may be to keep everything as dry as possible. Um, and then we'll run over and pull the shelter down and strap that to the outside of the pack. You know, mostly one, you're able to keep all your stuff dry. Uh, and then two, it's already soaking wet. You don't want to get anything else wet on the inside of your, your tent. Um, a couple other things, I guess, camps, camp spots and camp spots in general when you're hunting. Um, like right now, you can't see behind the camera, but for example, this may be a place that someday we might hunt. And if the elk are co- behind us is 
some gradual hills, kind of rolling hills, things like that, up into timber, bedding areas, basically. Uh, behind us, behind the camera, is there's a pretty big valley. On the other side of that valley, you got a pretty big rock wall. Now, if this was a case where I really didn't want to blow out the elk, let's say I didn't have to worry about other hunters screwing it up. If other hunters were going to come in here, I probably wouldn't worry about it as much. They're, they're probably going to camp on this side. But if I was secluded, I would probably camp on the other side of this valley because more than most likely elk are going to be coming out of those rock cliffs down. The wind won't be quite as bad because it's not going to be able to really get behind behind me with those rock cliffs and blow out as much as it probably could. And and I would probably set up over there and I can overlook this entire valley, uh, meaning in the morning I can come out to a glassing point, see where the elk are, uh, or in the evening, either one, uh, and, and basically not wind myself. Um, the other thing, we're still watching everyone climb here. That's the, kind of freaking me out. Oh, with her on the rock cliffs? Yeah, yeah. she's on some cliffs. and uh, That's just what I need. Yeah, hopefully Caitlin doesn't fall off. And it's pretty epic. Yeah, you die, you fall off that. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff Kaylee does too that I, I always get worried about. Um, the other stuff uh, that uh, people kind of want to, you want to think about, um, talk quite a bit with South Cox and David Long and some other like uh, Kip Fowler. Pretty well-known high country mule deer hunters, Robbie Denning. Uh, don't ever set up in the basin, right? I mean, <laughs> it happens a lot. You know, there's nothing worse. Elk hunting too, right? I mean, I've seen guys putting wall, t- wall tents up in the most pristine elk habitat known to man, and they throw up a wall tent right there. Same thing with uh, you, uh, the the mule deer specifically, and I am by no means an expert uh, mule deer hunter, but I can I do know a lot about high country mule deer, and when I say basin, basically a giant drainage, giant valley. It's it's really just grass and willows. Generally, you're going to have some escape routes. When you get back in there, uh, one thing I can tell you, we're, we're one of the places we're going to go fishing this summer. Um, it looks like there should be 200-inch mule deer running everywhere. There's not. The number one reason there's not is there is no escape route. There's no escape terrain for those mule deer. They will not be in that basin. They should be. It's got everything they need, but they won't be because of the escape terrain. It's one thing to think about. The next thing, if you have escape terrain, don't put your dumbass in the middle of the basin by the creek that's flowing down it because the mule deer will be there if you don't blow them out. A lot of times they'll be in those... The side hills of that basin bedded, and they'll come down in the midst of the middle of that basin, and they'll feed on those willows. The top of those trees are like uh, Snickers bars. Or not the top of those willows are like Snickers bars to them. And uh, when you put your tent there, <coughs> well, that's just not good. Right. Um, right. <laughs> what are some of the other questions that I've, I've forgot? What is uh, one, of one of the things uh, people <laughs> seem to overlook um, is uh, blowdowns and uh, windfalls like Widowmakers. So when you're coming in for your camping spot, one of the things that you always want to do is is you want to look up, see if there's any dead trees, any dead limbs, anything that might fall on you and kill you in the night when the wind comes. Especially beetle kill, the the great beetle kill forest of Colorado. Um, Real issue there. I've heard, uh, I know lots of friends that have had, uh, luckily I don't know anybody who's gotten hit, but I know a lot of guys as they were gone in the day had the trees fall down, destroy their shelters. Um. One of uh, Patrick's good friends had one fall on his sawtooth and just crush it. Um, so, yeah, definitely looking for it's that. It's something that, you know, a <laughs> lot of guys, I think, just forget about, take for granted, you know, just it's not on their mind. But that should be one of the first things you assess when you walk in to yeah. set up your shelter. I'm bad about I'm I'm actually bad. I've gotten better when I, we had a tree come down real close to us. It would have killed us if it hit us. You um, and uh, Colton had a close call. When we were packing the elk out, um, yeah. Colton had one almost fall on him. I mean, I, I say almost, I mean, 20 yards is almost, I mean, it's pretty dang well, close. Especially when it's a full-size tree. And it, yeah, it was a full-size live tree, so pretty heavy. Um, we were in pretty <laughs> high wind. It'll kill you. Yeah, that would have definitely got the job done. Um, other things to think about, <coughs> excuse me, uh, water sources, um, you know, it's good to camp by a water source. Uh, it's not good to camp by the only water source because that's also the only water source for a lot of deer, elk, things like that. Deer can go a long time without, you know, really hitting water, sheep, or even worse probably. But 
you know, if you've got one water source, you probably want to stay away from it. Uh, I say probably, you definitely want to stay for, away from it as much as possible. Uh, and just, you know, if you got to go down and get water from it, obviously you got to get water, but you don't want to camp by your only water source. Now in the case where we're at, we've got three major creeks flowing around us. It doesn't really matter. We can camp by our water source. And if we were hunting, I would probably be camping pretty close to the same spot we are now. If I was worried about other pressure again, if not, if there's no other pressure. I'd be maybe on that other side. Um, I don't worry about fires a lot. We talked about this doing cardio the other night. Um, one of the guys said his hunting partner won't, I can't say won't let him, but he's, you know, doesn't like building fires. I don't, I mean, I'm not going to go into a bedding area and strike up a fire, but I mean, I, I definitely don't get overly concerned about burning wood. They're used to it. They, they don't, I, I've never had an issue. We always kill stuff. I've never had an issue building a fire, so. And you're running a fire in a, in a, not just outside like this little fire in this, in this pit, but you're running a fire inside your shelter in a stove. Either way, it's smoke, it's fire, but, uh, so far it's never really impacted your helmet. No, 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 it, it hasn't. I mean, obviously you have to have some common sense involved for, for sure. You don't want to, um, Again, be in a bedding area, but you know, we camp far enough away generally to where it's not really going to matter. In fact, uh, I was with Dale Pearson. We had a fire going and you know, elk walked 20 yards from us. We didn't end up getting a shot, but I was, I was calling periodically, um, got breaking limbs and stuff like that. Just kind of a precaution thing. Really, I didn't think it'd actually work. And, uh, elk came right in, you know, good, pretty good fire going and the wind was definitely swirling. It might have even helped cover our scent. Who knows? But, uh, you know, some things to think about as far as setting up camp. The other thing I try to do, even though it may be hard to find your tent, I certainly don't try to advertise where I'm at. Um, I always try to tuck away a little bit, uh, as much as possible, especially high country mule deer. I definitely try to, to, um, you know, hide as, as much as I possibly can my shelter, not just for, um, uh, you know, the deer, but also for, for people to see. Uh, then again, if I'm on a deer, uh, I haven't actually done this personally. I know guys that will, if it's out of the eyes of the deer, but hunters can see it, uh, potentially they'll set it up there just to make sh- sure, uh, kind of you've staked your claim, so to speak, you know? Right. Uh, and I, I don't have to worry about with where we, we don't really run into too much competition. Thank goodness. It sounds like in the Wasatch though, it's like Mortal Kombat, uh, mule deer hunting from what Kendall was telling me about when we were out there telling us about. Let's see. I try to, some of the other different uh, questions I guess I've got was uh, on the clothing side of things, not necessarily brand specific, but um, scent. This came up on the panel. Mm -hmm. Merino wool versus synthetic. Um, uh, For me, I've I've never really changed this. I like to have at least a t-shirt in Merino wool. I don't always have a t-shirt. Sometimes, I mean, last year we wore gritty Bowman shirts, Kafaru shirts, whatever, right? We, I mean, mm-hmm. but on a on a hunt that's going to be a very extended hunt, I'll try to wear. I, I actually wear an icebreaker. It's like a ninety dollar freaking t shirt, but it's just this hundred and forty weight lightweight t shirt, and then synthetic over that. And the biggest thing for that is 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 synthetic dries out faster than merino. Merino doesn't stink, and that t shirt seems to just hold the funk away from the getting on the synthetic as much. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as far as the, uh, the synthetic portion of it, I was just talking to Amy about this. I like two midweight synthetics, uh, in the case, and, and we, we went over this in a different video, but like the, um, the core midweight from, from Sitka and then the core heavyweight hoodie. I do that for two reasons. One, um, which is simple fact, if I get cold, uh, two, as far as layer, uh, layering, if I get cold, meaning if it's super cold, I wear both other though, too, like there's different, you know, you did different variations of temperature constantly. If it's, if it's, you know, one, if you have like one day, I may just wear the, the medium weight all day long. The next may wait, next day may be like the, uh, the lightweight, like super, super lightweight, One day it could be like right now I'm wearing this heavyweight hoodie and I'm still actually a little bit chilled. I just have a t-shirt on underneath it. Uh, The moral of the story, I think, is is one, you're not going to bring deodorant in. You're not going to be able to shower every day. You're going to stink one way or another. I just worry about armpit rash. I'm kind of prone to it. And if I don't go, if I go a long time without a shower, 
eventually I will I will get that. And so that that merino wool t-shirt seems to help out a lot. And it's actually something I talked to Brinker about and uh, I'm going to talk to Barklow. I would really like for for Sitka to have a a lightweight merino wool t-shirt. Yeah. Um you you're wearing the jet stream right there. Yeah, I probably wouldn't backpack with it, you know, on a hunt. Yeah. Um you know, just because uh it's not waterproof. Yeah. And um it doesn't uh you know, you know these soft shells are not waterproof and and they don't they're not very insulated. Yeah. So um there's you don't really need it with the like the Kelvin active jacket or a puffy layer uh your rain jacket you know and then your your basic like Aaron said these midweight layers um it's kind of redundant to bring the 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 soft shell yeah and that's what you're really wanting to get is as light as you can and as warm as you can on a backpack hunt um i don't bring a whole lot anyway i like i said the kind of one or two uh, of the mid-weight kind of, you know, fleece layers. And then I have a puffy jacket and a rain jacket. That's about all I bring. And that's the thing. I'm always bringing a rain jacket because I just don't know for sure what's going to happen. And, and uh, you want to stay dry. Yeah, it's and, good wind block. And if you put the rain jacket on over an insulating layer, you're pretty dang warm. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's warm. Yeah. Yeah. Again, for those of you just tuning in, if you jumped into the middle, the reason why we're not looking at the camera is... uh Brian's daughter's climbing on cliffs across from us. Um, <laughs> but uh, the other thing uh, that you, some people have uh, kind of chimed in about was well, water purification systems. Um, f- you know, for, for me, I carry Aquamira or uh, MSR Aqua tabs for a, a backup water system, um, meaning like they're, it's lightweight, it's in my possibles pouch, and... Uh, it's also my for my camp water. So when I when I do the big bladder or whatever, I, I throw those in there, and then we use the Steripin um, uh, for like the Nalgene's to, to purify those Nalgene's. Uh, the biggest question I got were were pumps. How come I've kind of stayed away from pumps? Really, they're just heavy. I mean, there's that's the only reason. I'm kind of a wiener when it comes to that. I just don't haven't needed it in quite a long time. If I had to re- deal with a lot more dirtier water that i have hunted in other places i would ha- i would need a pump um yeah i think keep this clean though yeah it's really nice to have it. we mix up a lot of <clears throat> we will use those noon tablets uh, electrolytes we'll use in, uh, enduro, enduro yeti ignite you know we'll throw in uh you'll do throw in like some lemonade whatever into our drinks and it's we're always mixing stuff and it's tough to do that with a bladder. You don't really want to, it's, it gums it all up. And so we both bring water bottles and it's just easy to pull the water right out of the stream and then, and then use the. Yeah. I've got an MSR drum light. We covered this in another video, but it seems like we can't cover it enough. Yeah. I bring a bladder. The steri pin is just too convenient. Yep. Yep. The bladders for camp water or if we're traveling a long ways, we're, the analogy may not be enough for the day. Mm-hmm. Um, and with tablets as a backup, just in case your electronic steripin goes down on you, you're, you're fine. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, the aqua tabs or the, uh, aqua mirror works really well. Sorry about the wind. We are in the, uh, the wilderness. We got a big gust right there. As far as layering though, though, um, you know, I, I do like synthetic a lot. Um, I like Merino. Um, I don't, I like the way Merino doesn't smell. Um, I, I like though that it's, it's, it, you know, your synthetics are lighter. They don't weigh as much, especially if you're going in a thicker Merino and then they dry out so fast. Yeah. Those... And the Merino gets wet. It's kind of, it keeps you warm in spite of being wet, but you're still wet. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think, and it could be, you know, whatever, obviously when we um, started working with Sitka, people might have been asking the question to see if our views have changed it's still pretty much the same as it's always been i like a merino base layer and then a uh, little thief a squirrel came in yeah they're like three feet <laughs> um merino base layer and then synthetic over that uh some 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 other questions that we got uh that a little bit kind of some of them were hunting related and we're not hunting right now but the the kill kit 
guys, I got six or seven emails out of the blue if my kill kit had changed. Um, and we again, we've covered these things before, but in my my kill kit is a, a set or two of bomb bags, the uh, the, the tag bags, uh, depending upon how many animals we're planning on taking down. I've got a Havilon knife. I generally have rubber gloves. I don't always use those. I've got um, some kind of a cord, right, whether it be 1.8 or 2.3 or whatever um, cord. I usually carry 50 feet of that, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more. I've got ribbon in there, um, you know, just for, for flagging ribbon, uh, for a blood trail type of a ribbon. Uh, and then I always have either a 55 liter, uh, dry sack, uh, some kind of a contractor bag, something in there for transportation of the meat. Or in this case, that water is super cold. If we killed something here, I bet we could keep it good for a couple weeks. I mean, that water mm-hmm. is super cold. The one thing I do, um, is I let, I try to let as much blood come out of the meat as possible. So before I'll put it in that Creek, it, I'll just let it hang, kind of rotate in the inner meat, the meat from the middle to the outside and, you know, till it's all cooled off and the meat tastes better the more you let it drain. And so if we're hurry, obviously it might go right into the Creek, but the idea being for good meat care, get it out of the Creek until it's, it's pretty much uh, drained as much as possible, and and it actually ages. But I mean, it tastes better. It ages more or less. Um, yeah. or from what I've screwed around with it. Yeah, I think uh, we've done a couple of podcasts on meat care in the backcountry, and I think we kind of covered everything. Yeah, we we beat that the dead but, horse to death for sure. But definitely, uh, air and cool. This you know, moisture and heat. Those are two really bad things for. Or that that's what aids in 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 uh the aging process and the meat going bad rotting yeah yeah, yeah for sure so aaron you know a number of people i know we kind of just talked about it and we we did it in the panel not too long ago and but what is your layering system from socks to to hat from top to bottom what are you wearing so for socks i wear pretty much two sets darn tough and fits um the I'm actually kind of swaying more towards fits now because the uh, the seam doesn't hit my pinky toe um, on the outside, mm-hmm. and on darn tougher they they do um, hit. So darn tougher fits or the socks. Uh, I don't generally ever wear long johns until it's really cold. Um, do you for, just wear one sock? Yep, I just wear one sock. You wear a la- you wear a liner. Um, I wear a smart wool like pantyhose types. <laughs> Uh, sock, and then uh, then I wear a, a lightweight, a very lightweight wool sock on top of that, and like a smart wool or darn tough. And I, I tell you, the guys that I know that use the liner system swear by it, and will use nothing but liners. They usually take a couple liners with them on a they don't weigh anything yeah. on a backpacking trip. Um, it was definitely an old school thing. Uh, now some of the say, oh, if you have merino wool, you don't need liners. I think it's a person's foot, and also what they become comfortable yeah. with um but they're the socks the same ones you wear they're a merino wool blend there's a little bit of uh, i have i have man. extremely uh sweaty feet, feet and hands yeah um even if we're just sitting around the house I'm, they're just they're always sweaty and uh i just find that when i wear that that sock liner on the very bottom that it um yeah, at, at the base layer, that it really wicks the moisture away from the foot very quickly. And if I get a rub, it's between the sock liner and my wool it, sock. It doesn't it doesn't create a hot spot on my actual skin. And that's where that liner came from. Was your friction area is between your liner that's on your foot and your sock on the outside, and that's where the friction happens, not the sock against your foot causing a blister. And, and I just. You know, I'll swear by it. It's just for me. It's I even right now I'm squishing my toes around in my foot, in my in my boot. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> and uh, the sock slide. The, you know, the sock liner, the wool uh, liner that's really hyper thin. Yeah. Um. It it just slides around and and there's no friction on my foot. Um. So anyway, uh, that's that's how I do it. You have your system, but I you, think you should try both if you're a guy with foot problems, though. Yeah, I and I and it. I and I have. I really, I've I've done it both ways a lot, and I can get away without wearing a sock liner, no problem. But I just feel a lot better with one on, more comfortable. 
I, I'll get friction inside the inside just from hiking and hiking, but it never turns into a hot spot when I've got these on. Yeah. Um, one thing that, uh, with that layering system, there's one more layer you have that you, you put on your feet most Luco of the time. Tape. Yeah. Talk about that. I don't even know if it's most of the time, dude. I, it's all the Is time. Is it just all now. the time? I, and not, not my whole foot. Uh, almost every, every, almost all my buddies do it. We pre tape with Luco tape on our heels. Um, for, you know, whatever reason in the industry, heel rub, I don't, whatever. It's like, you know, what it's a, overtaking the world but we all pre-tape heels uh our heels it lasts about seven you know it'll last around seven days she's in a safer spot now okay. we're watching uh brian's daughter climb um uh, it lasts about seven days on a backpack hunt maybe even longer than that if you're not showering um and it, it's literally just precautionary um and it's the same principle as the liner mm -hmm. i'm having friction between my sock and that tape I've never got a blister under Luco tape. I buy it on Amazon. It's L E U K O, I believe is how it's spelled. Yep. How it's spelled. I think it's five ninety nine a roll. Um, I usually buy like six rolls at the beginning of the year. It works good for first aid, but it if there's some kind of a compound in the glue that sticks or in the the sticky stuff, and once heat hits it, it sticks to your skin better. But that uh, that's that's but, that's been a game changer for me. Yeah, I was gonna say, but that that's a that's a money. That's a game changer right there. When I've gone on steep climbs before Luco tape, even with boots that are broken in, um, just because of how my heels are built, uh, it's worn silver dollar size blisters on my heels. I've, I've, I've been in a lot of pain from blisters before. Um, the next thing, so, you know, working the way up, pants. The one thing I would say is uh, try to... Try to get nylon pants over polyester if you can. Nylon is, is better than polyester. Polyester is still good. Um, nylon is just a little bit better. Uh, you know, and, and as far as like your spandex, the amount of spandex, uh, 12 to 14%, I think, is about where you want to be uh, inside of, uh, in the blend of nylon spandex. Uh, as far as what we're wearing or what we'll be wearing this year, um, and I, not to bash Sitka for past things, it looked like I pooped my pants in every set of Sitka pants they came out with until this year. In fact, um, Amy has commented on my butt multiple times, which I don't really have one, that uh, the new pants were good. So thank you, Sitka, for that. But <laughs> there's the ascent that, you know, the, the brass tacks of it, the day hunting pant is the ascent, the mountain, and the timberline. This will probably be the last trip I'll wear Timberline until, you know, late September, October, just because they're warmer type pants. After that, you've got the Ascent and the Mountain Pants. I, I would have told you Mountain Pants um, before I tried these new Ascents. I, I, I don't know, and this isn't because they're working with us. I don't want to get any shit from you listeners about we're puppets from Sitka. <laughs> I, that Ascent pant. Is legit. I would say that is one of, if not the best warm weather pant I've ever used. The cuts, great. They're a little bit loud when you first get them. You wash them once or twice. They stretch well. They dry well. What's amazing, they block wind relatively well for as thin as they are. Um, the mountain pant, a little bit thicker material, but they are, um, I would say that is an elk hunting pant all around pant is the mountain. Like that's good for elk, mule deer, sheep, anything except super hot weather. So one of those three, but for elk season, it's just going to definitely going to be the ascent or the mountain pant. Man, those ascent, not only do they, they breathe and in, in they, and you feel like you're wearing some kind of pajama bottom. That's hardly nothing like, which I love the mobility and, and how well they breathe. But I was telling you for how well they breathe. I'm shocked how well they also block the wind. Which is a uh, one of the good things about how they're they're woven, but also with nylon. Nylon's a little bit better for that. Um, we got a little bit of wind picking up. Kind of turn my head here. Hopefully, block it from the wind. The uh, the one thing I'll say um, with uh, you know the clothing system um, that you you really need to to make sure that you are dressed for success according to you know the area, the time of year you're going. Um, what I'm giving you now would be my general packing list for any animal in September, let's say, just about anywhere. So just, just so we're on the same page. Um, going up to my up top, 
if I had to pick a layering system right now for elk hunting, um, again, I wear an icebreaker t-shirt. Uh, it's at, like, again, 140 weight. Uh, above that, uh, sometimes I'll wear, I'll have like a, uh, just a, uh, I usually wear a rock slide sleeveless t-shirt too. Sometimes I'll have both. Above that is going to be, um, something like, uh, oh, the core lightweight hoodie. It's, uh, got a mask inside of it. Uh, it's super lightweight. That's what I'm going to hunt with throughout the day. I may have the, uh, the core medium weight and then the core heavyweight hoodie above that. I may bring all three of those depending. Um, for the most part, I would guess though, I would have the, uh, core lightweight hoodie and then above that have the, you know, over the top of that have the core heavyweight hoodie. So it would just depend on how cold it is as far as, you know, if, um, I'm going to take all three or not, uh, it, 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 and even then, if it's really cold, I may wear the fanatic hoodie, but if I had to pick one right now and I had to take it with me, pack it, it'd be the, the lightweight hoodie, the medium and the heavyweight hoodie. I, I'm, those things are money. I really like those. Uh, above that, I, I'm probably going to bring the Kelvin Active Jacket. I've been super happy with that thing so far. Um, you know, there's a, there's also a regular Kelvin jacket. There's a Kelvin Down hoodie. But for me, for what I'm doing, that Kelvin Active uh, will probably be going with me this year. Above that, it's just going to be the uh, Stormfront rain gear. Um, there's, they, there's several. They make a lighter set as far as, uh, you know, Sitka. But the storm front would be what I would wear. Now, if I was going to hit real adverse conditions or, um, you know, up in BC, let's say, whatever the case may be, I may bring the, uh, the cold front jacket. It's a lot heavier. Some guys would, would probably disagree with me on that. I've just fallen in love with that, that jacket and, uh, had great, great luck with it. Uh, for, you know, my headwear, it's pretty cut and dry jet stream beanie hat. Um, guaranteed that thing goes with me everywhere i may bring one of the lighter weight beanie hats but the jet stream's definitely going with me and then um you know they actually have multiple different baseball hats that i like i've been wearing that flex fit hat more than anything um from them uh so it, it just depends as far as that goes but as long as it's synthetic otherwise it'll stink real quick on my noggin um and then as far as gloves go I'm kind of weird. Like I, it doesn't take real cold weather for me to go to the uh, white tail line mitten glove to have to bring it with me. That you can take the mitten off and the the fingers still work and they're covered as well. I actually wore them for cardio the other day. My hands get real real cold. Um, I honestly by the end of September would almost bet those will be in my pack for the simple fact I lose feeling in my fingers so easy. You got to kind of adapt. Um, after that, I believe with me right now, I have the jet stream glove is, uh, what I have and and it, it could be the cold front glove. I'm, I'm not sure I need to go look, but either way, that's like my system right there with, uh, what I'm probably going to take me with me for, for elk season. After that, really, it's just going to, you know, boil down to my, my puffy jacket. The Kelvin active is not the greatest puffy in my opinion for like super cold weather. So that's probably going to transfer to uh, a down hoodie, a down puffy, um, like the, the Kel- Kelvin light uh, down hoodie or whatever they call it. But I think it's the Kelvin light um, or one of the other models that the general idea you want to get is basically I'm going to need a thicker puffy jacket as it gets cold. The storm front probably still going to go with me until it's real cold in the cold front. Um, I will say Sitka makes a numerous a clothing line that is almost confusing, but that system right there, I think just about anywhere, no matter where you go, you're going to be okay for, for elk and mule deer in September, no matter what. And I, you're probably going to pack almost same step. You wear a vest. That's one of the big things. Yeah. I really like vests. So, um, they help me regulate temperature. Well, Aaron doesn't seem to sweat or overheat maybe as much as I do. Um, but I get cold, so a vest works really well because I throw that vest on and then, uh, and I can hike yet I stay cool. So I just kind of need to keep the core warm sometimes without, oh, you know, and if I can keep my, uh, arms and everything uncovered, then I stay, I stay a nice temperature. Yeah. And then I, I will just like it. Oh yeah. I will say closer to the road. That's when the jet stream would probably come out for me, even though I don't really bring a soft shell, um, on backpack hunts. 
They are nice because they, they're a little bit waterproof or water resistant. They block a little bit of wind. The biggest thing is they're quieter than, than rain gear. I'll tell you, I wore it most most of the time. Most days I wore um, this Jetstream jacket, the subalpine, and the subalpine vest on um, Prince of Wales in southeast Alaska. And it rained a lot, and I just got it wet, and it would dry out in a few, couple, in an hour. I mean, it dries out super fast. And it blocks the wind like crazy. We were out on the ocean and the skiff cruising around and it starts pouring rain. I just got wet. It still kept me warm. And then, but I was always coming back to like a base camp. Mm -hmm. So I liked it for that. But for backpacking, it's just, I think it might be more weight than I'm willing to bring. For what uh, it offers. Yeah, for what it offers, given all the, you know, given the fact I'm not leaving a puffy behind. I'm not leaving a rain jacket behind, um, you know or a mid-weight layer so it's sort of just one extra layer i don't really need but i love it when i can when i'm car camping or or you know coming yeah. back to a uh, you yeah. know or, or not hiking wall in that tent. Floor. yeah when you're not dying from carrying camera gear um yeah i would say uh one of the other if we go to the it, we covered that pretty good i think um yeah the one of the other uh, big questions i got recently was uh energy <laughs> in the uh in the back country, right? Like, what do I do for, is it coffee? Is it, <laughs> is it monster? Is it, what, is it, it, you know, Yeti from mountain ops? And uh, generally, uh, I drink coffee in the morning. Um, uh, it's the, either a cafe Busto or however you pronounce it, or a Starbucks via pack. Generally, I have two of those at one time with two <laughs> hot chocolates in the morning to snap me up. Um, I'll either after that, to, it'll be some type of pre-workout, um, John Pinch takes blaze pills for mountain ops, for example. Yep. I don't take the blaze pills. I've been taking the ignite more. Um, I have a stronger, uh, pre-workout that I put in an emergency kind of a kit that, uh, I don't even know it. It's certainly not safe for everyone. Um, <laughs> Wordline illegal, Aaron? Are you talking about? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if the FDA does ban it. And, you know, we laugh about that, but if you if you started lifting in the '90s and saw what has been banned since then, um, yeah. So when Mark McGuire was cranking home runs, <laughs> uh, what he was taking, yeah, and he could have been taking more of that, but what he was taking at the time, you could buy at GNC, you could yeah. buy at multiple. It's banned now, right? You couldn't yeah. find it. You can't even buy it illegally now. Um, I mean, obviously, you can buy steroids illegally, but when you get anything with 450 milligrams of caffeine per serving, that's what someone is supposed to take in in a day. And you have also added in that niacin, uh, white willow birch bark, uh, picotropin, coleus forskali, all these other enhancing roots, supplements, energy type pills, energy type uh, additives. Um, even though I'm addicted to it, I mean, I drink it all the time, all this different stuff. Yeah. Uh, long term, it's not good for you. I mean, there's no way around it. I will say though, that for those addicted to, um, caffeine on a, a health aspect, which I got asked the question, what do I bring and what are the adverse effects? One of the reasons I don't drink Yeti is because it has, um, creatine or creatine. And that is, it, it hydrates your muscles, but also dehydrates you. Caffeine is also a diuretic or a dehydrating substance, however you want to put. I'm not a doctor. Uh, I have played one on te television. It is not good to take in that much caffeine, even though I do. I'm probably about 600 milligrams, four to 600 milligrams a day because of my migraines. I keep a pretty good log on it right now. Um mm -hmm. And so as far as energy, I take coffee in the morning and then usually around noon to two, I take, I'll drink another coffee, a blaze shot, ignite, pre-workout, something like that to carry me through the course of the day, uh, there are the rest of the day. Obviously you don't want to be packing monsters in pre-made monster drinks in. So it's usually in a powder or pill form. Um, I, I, <laughs> I really don't want to go into too much more than that because the last thing I want is some 17-year-old chuckle-headed kid pounding down pre-workout or some 50-year-old fat dude having a heart attack because he took pre-workout. Be cautious anytime you're taking any of that. 
Don't start with a full scoop. Start with a half. Um, don't start with two blaze pills. Take one. Figure out your tolerance, especially at high altitude. Your body's doing weird crap, anything above 10, 11,000 feet. And you don't want to be like, oh, I'm tired. Let me pop 450 milligrams of caffeine real quick and head up to 13.5, right? You don't yeah. want to do that. So be real cautious on that. Um, I, I'm i really liking the Ignite blend from Mountain Ops yeah, a lot. I take that apple flavor, whatever it is. The sour apple's good. The pink lemonade's pretty refreshing when you're hiking in the mountains. Um I've always been a fan of Yeti. I respond well to it. Like Aaron talks about, um, you know, the creatine in there can dehydrate you a little bit. Or uh, I find that um, if I'm on creatine for, and this is whether it's with Mountain Ops or anybody else, I mean, any creatine supplement, I'll be trying to poop diamonds after about two and a half months on it, two months. Yeah. And uh, so it's really just... um, it can just kind of dehydrate the bowels or, or yeah. whatever. I just, I just dry you out or dry whatever. you out a little bit. So, but man, if I start taking that stuff for two or three weeks uh, around week four, five, six, man, I'm, I'm, I'm getting big gains in, in strength. Sometimes I'll peak in the summer, you know, with some of my lifts, I just feel like I recover much faster. Definitely. I get, I gain about 10 pounds of water weight yep. from, uh, from creatine. Uh, as they take it, they say standard is eight to twelve. Yeah, what you're and, and I, it's right away. I get a little puffier looking, but um, I recover fast. So when we go into September, I like to stop, kind of taking. You know, around mid August, I usually will stop taking creatine, um, and uh, I'll still those muscles will stay well hydrated going into September, or when we first start our hunts. Um, but I'll take uh, I'll take Yeti yeah. for that energy boost. Um, I cycle off of any every stimulant that I ever take. I cycle on and I cycle off. Um, I find that if I just keep taking it, it doesn't work anymore. Yeah, and that's say, with you, any stimulant. You crap out, and and I can say, you know, even if you don't crap out, let's say if coffee just wakes you up, mm-hmm. you you're gonna be tired where maybe it lasted four or five hours before, and now it's an hour. Or, right. Or, you know, it, it, your body gets used to it. And, it, it and when I cycle off, it's crappy for a few days or a week even. Um, so I, I really want that stuff to be effective when I'm actually on the trail. Yeah. Um, when I'm hunting, when I want that performance gain. Um, so, it, like I said, and, I, and I'll mix them up because each of them have a sort of a different stimulant for different use. For, yeah. You know, but... um. I've never really done a lot of enduro, although you yeah, like that's it. That's all I take. Not all I take. I don't take Yeti. I take enduro. But yeah. yeah. So very interesting. Um, I take enduro and I feel dehydrated. I take Yeti and I don't. Yeah. Well, and I think too, and I, I, again, I'm not a doctor, um, but some people, you know, if you have your liver levels checked, the, the, the liver naturally produces creatine or creatine already. Um, mm-hmm. Some people... Just like any 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 drug, any performance enhancing supplement, anything, everybody everybody's body handles metabolizes it different. Yeah, the yeah. stuff differently. Yeah. yeah, and different parts and pieces and components to different stimulants. Um, some people handle differently than than others, and and that I guess brings up to the next subject is what else do do I bring? Do you bring? Um, as far as vitamins, do I take a multivitamin? Do I, you know, whatever. And, and we have talked about this quite a bit as well, but I take the biotic, um, f- uh, from mountain ops, which is a probiotic. Uh, I, that is one thing from mountain ops that I can stand back and say this, if it's not the best probiotic, it's one of the best ones that I've found. Um, and there's, uh, you can, you can Google different ways to test biotics, um, or pro, probiotics, but, um, I take the probiotic. I take, um, I generally try to take four fish oil pills a day of the type that I, that I buy. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they are kind of expensive. Um, two in the morning, two when I go to bed. Um, I take zinc. Um, I take, uh, I think it's nature's, nature's bounty multivitamin. I can't remember. It's an organic multivitamin. I take that. Um, I also take like Phoenix, which is, um, 
from Mountain Ops, but it's uh, recovery. And then the other one I take that I've just started from them, and honestly, it's experiment, is uh, for inflammation. Mm -hmm. But since I don't consume a lot of gluten since I stopped, mm -hmm. my inflammation has gone basically down to, to nothing. And I can tell you, whoever says that's a crock, uh, you're full of it because the week I stayed with Lander, the two weeks mm – -hmm. My hands and knees swelled up so much, and I had so much inflammation from eating so much bread that it literally is like a slap in the face of what what processed wheat, basically, how bad it is for you um, in gluten, whatever. Um, but either way, I, I try, and then I, I always have 800 milligrams of ibuprofen ready to go for each day. Obviously, very rarely I take that much, or, or most days I don't take it at all. Um, but I do have 800, I have four 200 milligram t tablets in my pack just in case. They don't weigh anything. I've got to be pretty beat up uh, to take ibuprofen. You know, I don't want to take it for any reason, but I can tell you I will take it without blinking an eye if I'm beat up um, to help. It's just ibuprofen is horribly bad for your internal components. It's bad for your liver. It's bad. I think it eats away your stomach wall. Mm -hmm. Just a bunch of other bad that shit. That for too. your gut, really. Your I mean, stomach. it'll cause uh, ulcers and L stuff like long that. Long-term problems. Super but the bad. big thing is, too, it also, uh, you know, your body's natural healing process is inflammation and clear the inf inflammation. I mean, inflammation is part of uh, healing. And uh, NACID, N-A-S-I-D, is that how you say I, it? I think so, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. That's that's what ibuprofen is. It's an anti-inflammatory in this family of, family of pharmaceuticals. But it... It sort of inhibits the healing process. Yeah. Um, so, uh, like Aaron, I'll, I'll pack a little bit of ibuprofen. I don't think I've had, I don't think I took any last year um, at all. I mean, but I'll have it in the pack because one day I'm going to sprain an ankle bad up in the mountains, far, far in. A headache. That's headache. No something's that. going to come on me. And, uh, and, uh, it's it's really to treat an emergency situation. Um, I have sprained an ankle before to where it was real bad, like I couldn't walk on it. I eat ibuprofen like it's candy all day for two days, and and I'm walking around. Yeah, without I, that, uh, yeah, the it's the pain severe, you know. And again, it's not for any health purpose; it's for an emergency purpose. So. Yeah, this isn't something I, for good for your body, like taking fish oil pills. I get muscle knots uh, on the right side. In fact, as I'm talking about that, I'm trying to remember to sit upright <laughs> so Dr. Austin doesn't yell at me, um, my chiropractor. But uh, back in here on my right side and on my left side up high, I get muscle knots sometimes so bad I, I can't turn my head left and right. Mm -hmm. Sleeping on the sleeping pad, I'll take ibuprofen for that. Um, I don't, I don't, you know, I hear uh, people go back and forth on, is it a, not ibuprofen. Ibuprofen is definitely not placebo, but it does a multivitamin help. Does a probiotic help? Um, the one thing I can say is training like we do now, um, especially with the repetition of the same thing, you can really base, um, you have a good baseline of where you were, where you are, where you maybe you want to be and have baselines for what you're taking, the pain you're feeling, things like that. And Absolutely. I could, at 40 years old and, and, and kind of a fat kid at heart, um, and at the speed we go, uh, how we feel, we're at 10,000 feet right now or just under 10,000 feet. Um, I think that uh, the one thing people need to c take into consideration, I know uh, uh, hopefully my, my, my buddy doesn't yell at me. There was a website started, and I'm sure there's a podcast coming of Not Fit to Hunt, which is uh, – kind of a joke about, I don't know, overweight hunters yeah, yeah. killing stuff. And, and, uh, and my buddy, I'm not going to mention his name. I don't want to pick. He very successful hunter. The guy gets it done every year. Um, the one thing I will say is uh, I know what I felt like before, and I know what I felt like now that I'm, 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 I'm trying to eat healthier, no gluten, whatever, drink 120 ounces of water a day. And it's kind of like when someone first finds Jesus. It just won't shut up about it, right? They got to tell everyone to an annoying point sometimes. Nothing against religion, right? I'm just saying somebody finds God and it's like, oh, and they're popping on the soapbox and they're telling you about it because it's making them feel better. It's made them a better person. And in their mind, they want to 
share the wealth. They want everyone to know. They want to stand on the mountaintop. I can say um, with the healthy side of things, I try not to do it, but I do. And it Mm -hmm. pisses some people off. Um, This isn't referring to my buddy. It's just the way. But I know how much better I feel now. That yeah. and I mean my stomach from leaky gut, from to, to knee problems, mm-hmm. elbow problems, everything. Um, it's, a, it's a big difference. Yeah, I was gonna say, you know, often when I have someone come tell tell me the vitamins don't make a difference, uh, or or minerals or whatever, yeah, whatever, yeah, you know, um, a lot of times that's coming from a guy, a buddy of mine who eats McDonald's on a regular basis, and. Uh, some of this stuff, yeah, you're right. It doesn't make any difference if you're not doing other stuff yeah. too. Yeah. So if you're not hiking a mountain every now and then or a few days a week if, or, or just hiking or exercising, treadmill, whatever it is, you know, rowing. If you're not exercising a few days a week and you're not eating clean, unprocessed foods, then you're probably not going to really feel the d- incremental improvement from fish oil and, and uh, vitamins. Yep. You know, it's like you can't just – so it, it builds on itself. Um, now, yeah, I'm absolutely confident that, dude, if I don't take calcium and magnesium as a supplement um, and some glucosamine on a regular basis along with my other vitamins and minerals that I take yeah, and fish oil, that I feel at 43 – you know, I feel it in my knees and, and my ankles and my hips and stuff, my joints primarily, my hands especially. Yeah. And, and when I normally don't, it, it, and it, and it has everything to do with supplementation. Uh, I used to be like, man, I, you know, 10 years ago, they're like, my knee's acting up, man. My knee's yeah. bugging me. Well, a lot of that was flat out supplementation was yeah. missing. I was not getting enough calcium, magnesium into my system enough glucosamine and so it wasn't i wasn't uh i was thinking that my joints were breaking down really it was just a supplement problem yeah lubrication in some cases yeah. basically and and i know um uh in the case of like i keep, everybody keeps asking me am i getting skinnier from cardio i'm not really doing any more cardio than maybe a little bit more than normal but the biggest thing is is uh amy is a is a cook and she cooks all organic. So for me, uh, I, I don't even think it's humanly possible for me to cook like her. I just don't have it in me. But she, everything is fresh, right? So she cuts up everything. Um, You're basically eating cleaner than you've ever done, eat, eating healthier than you've ever eaten because Amy's there to help you do it. Yeah, I mean, that's not really helping. She does it, right? I mean, <laughs> there's no help other than I carry the groceries in. But I mean, so – when you when you're eating something that healthy, and then and let's say you only drop three or four pounds, um, but then you know, okay, well before if I made it to the top of the fire road in 20 minutes, we were moving right. Mm-hmm. If, now we're hitting the 17 mark frequently in the 17s. You are, and uh, well, yeah, <laughs> I am. Um, I and the other Aaron, um, <laughs> but we're doing doing it repetitively every right. day where. You know, some people may may or may not be able to do that. So at 40, I'm at the peak fitness level. This isn't a bragging thing. I'm not looking for anybody giving anybody shit about it. I'm just saying if you're able to be at 40 in a peak fitness level and recovering as fast as we are doing it again, hitting the gym in the morning, um, not to see too many squirrels, I think supplementation in a good way, meaning natural supplements, um, me- meaning fish oil pills, things like that, uh, are good eating clean. Uh, really clean uh, is very, very important. And I think, you know, as far as longevity, I'd like to be able to be doing this when I'm 60, uh, where before I was thinking if I could make it to, a, if I was 50, it'd be a miracle. Mm-hmm. Now I'm thinking if I can make it to where I'm still doing good at 60 plus, um, Patrick Smith's a great example. He's finally breaking down at 75, right? Yeah. And that's pretty freaking good. And he still trains and I mean, he's going on hunts with us. And he's abused, abused, you know, he's been in the mountains yeah. his entire life. He's always eaten clean. Uh, he's never eaten chocolate. He's never been a, uh, a, a big sweets guy or anything like that. And that's been a huge difference for him. So, um, I think, um, did you fart? Oh man, Brian dropped the bomb. Uh, so definitely supplementation, stay clean, eat all that kind of stuff. Um, 
I don't think – I think Brian's got to go potty. So we're going to wrap this thing up. Uh, coming at you live from the wilderness. Stay gritty, everyone. <laughs> the future of public lands. All of us own them. All of us use them. Political activists are demanding us to hand over the public lands where the state's legislators could transfer and control these lands. U.S. citizens own 640 million acres of public lands, which creates 6.1 million jobs and generates $646 billion per year. States have been selling off land to pay bills for over 100 years, thus closing access to the public. 39% of original 64 million acres have been sold. The cost of land management would break most state budgets. For instance, who will pay the hundreds of millions of dollars to fight major wildfires each year? It doesn't matter how many promises are made. The financial reality is it will force states to have to sell off our public land. President Theodore Roosevelt said, we must preserve our lands for future generations, not merely to the people now alive but to the unborn people. Our duty to the whole bids us restrain an unprincipled present-day minority from wasting the heritage of these unborn generations.